Roth here. Welcome to my world, where it's naturally supernatural. My guest died medically, went to heaven, and now brings heaven's atmosphere and miracles wherever he shares this experience. Next. Sid Roth has spent over 40 years researching the strange world of the supernatural. Join Sid for this edition of It's Supernatural. Randy Kay trained employees in Fortune 500 corporations, founded four companies, authored seven books. Uh, Randy, it's hard to believe, having come to know you, uh, that you were a really fervent agnostic at some time. Uh, but at 25, everything changed. What happened? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I had shouted out at a window, you know, God, if you are there, I need to know you as more than pages in a book. And so I had a severe accident where my car was blindsided on a freeway. It went over a ditch and rolled over. And I didn't have my seatbelt on. And I wow. was young at this time, as you said, 25. My head uh, started, it, it crashed through the windshield, but I survived that accident. But what I noticed while suffering from the concussion and broken bones is that I was being drawn to want to know God, not just know about God. And so I walked into a charismatic church and they were just holding their hands up and shouting and, and they were no longer fools in my mind. <laughs> they, were, they had something I wanted and I became born again in that church. So, look, he's running hard. I mean, hard after God. And then the devil decided to set him up one tragedy after another after another. I, I think the thing that really hit you was when uh, you're working for a company that develops a cure for Alzheimer's and the FDA decided because a few people it didn't work for that you can't use this and help people. That, that had to destroy the company and destroy you, I would think. Absolutely, we were this close to coming up with a potential cure for Alzheimer's. And I was out in Washington, D.C. We were on the front cover of Time Magazine in every major network news in announcing this uh, new drug. And then the FDA, for various reasons, had with, withdrawn the drug, actually what they call blacklisted the drug, meaning that we could not go any further. It was off the market, no more research, we were done. And then I came, I, f I flew back home from that, distraught, uh, and then I was laid off. I uh, became a CEO of a biotech company, and we needed to raise 60 million for that. And that didn't happen, and I was sitting in a coffee shop with my wife saying, you know, I think, uh, I think the Lord has abandoned us. And uh, I had a crisis of faith. And, but it's not just us. Uh, you had a couple of small kids, too. Had a couple of small kids, so now I was without an income with a large mortgage in San Diego, California, and uh, I shouted out to God in my bedroom one evening. I said, God, I have faithfully served you. I've been an ordained minister. I have worked on your behalf. I was the teacher in a 4,000 member church. I had served you faithfully. Why are you not answering my prayers? The moonlight struck the light in the room, the bedroom, and there was a like a shadow across the ceiling that darkened, that reflected my darkened soul. And I said, this time, God, you have to show up. Uh, that, that's, you know, that's a pretty strong thing. Yes. It's actually a dangerous thing. Uh, so you're out on a job interview and all of a sudden you're starting to feel strange. Yes. Explain. Well, I returned from that interview and landed, went straight to bed at home, and then I got up in the middle of the night and my 
calf was sore. In fact, it was so sore I could barely walk down the stairs. And so I finally got down the stairs and, and I normally would bike up the coast. And so I got my bicycle and I started bicycling up the coast. But not only was it difficult to bicycle up the coast because it felt like uh, climbing a mountain, but I was very winded and I didn't understand this. Normally the ocean would soothe me and comfort me, but it did not. So I struggled to get back home because I could, I could not breathe effectively at this point and my legs, my right leg was sore. I got home and uh, we were planning a trip to the mountains and that was uh, after a long deal of stress. And so I decided, you know, I should have known better. I went to the orthopedic doctor, you know, the bone doctor of all things, and I wanted an anti-inflammatory to reduce the swelling because my calf was about one and a half times its uh, size. And uh, I collapsed and ended up in the ER. What was the matter? I had, I was diagnosed with six blood clots. And because I had let them go and had exercised, those blood clots had traveled up the leg, they had enlarged, and they had lodged within my pulmonary artery, which is the main blood flow to the lungs. And in addition to that, they rushed a patient out of the room, and I did not understand until later they told me, uh, one of the uh, nurses told me that that patient had MRSA, which is a bacterial resistant strain of, and, uh, and I mean, of drug resistant bacteria, and what happened there is that that caused further clotting within my body. So it was like a traffic jam throughout my body. I was clotting all over to the point where the doctor could not pull out a, a blood sample from, uh, from my brachial artery, from my arm. The next day, you had an encounter with the God you were angry with. What happened? Uh, I went into septic shock and cardiac arrest. My heart stopped. <clears throat> and this was during a period of a little over 30 minutes. I started flopping on the bed like a floppy fish out of water, and then everything went dark. And I saw immediately thereafter, I saw uh, what I know today to be warring angels. These were otherworldly figures. There were one, on one side were brilliantly uh, or, uh, or uh, just clothed uh, angels. On the other side, they looked more worn. And they were battling with what looked like swords. And I couldn't quite figure it out. But I knew this, Sid. I knew that I needed to cry out the name of Jesus Christ. And I cried out the name of Jesus Christ. And immediately, Immediately, I was side to side with a figure, and, he, and his soft robe was against me, and he wrapped his left arm around my left shoulder, and I could feel, as he pressed his cheek against my cheek, I could feel the soft bristles, and I knew that it was Jesus, and the first thought I had was, so, so this is love, so this is love. And then he turned me face to face, and I looked into the eyes of love. And the first thing he said to me was, trust me. And he tunneled the light of Jesus Christ, which I understand, and many people talk about the, the bright light was the glory of God. And it tunneled that light from his, uh, his personhood, tunneled into every dark place and exposed every dark place so that the comfort of the, of the Lord Jesus Christ was just pervasive throughout me. And the presence of the Lord uh, spoke to me and revealed to me all the things that uh, Jesus wanted me to know. Uh, you got to tell me quickly, you saw someone you knew in heaven. Tell me quickly what happened. Yes, well, I did meet my grandmother in heaven, but there was one person I knew that I'd forgotten, and that was a little boy. Um, I served in my younger years as an orderly in a hospital, and I'd entered a room to serve some food to a, to a boy probably about seven years old. And when I entered the room, he was skin and bones. His veins were showing in his skin. His eyes were hollowed out. And um, he said to me, I'm going to heaven. And I said, well, that's 
good. I don't believe in heaven, but, <laughs> but, but that's good for you. I'm sure if there is a heaven that you'll be there. And he said, I'll pray for you. And, uh, and I did, I'd forgotten this. And the Lord showed it to me to remind me that his simple prayer had been effective in heaven to call down God's righteousness to convict me of my sins, but also to save me so that I would acknowledge him. And at the very moment I was looking at this boy in this vignette saying that I would be in heaven, I was in heaven. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. Jesus taught Randy 31 revelations while he was in heaven. Want to hear a few and have Randy release the atmosphere of heaven for miracles? Be right back. <laughs> we will be right back to It's Supernatural! Turn to It's Supernatural. Uh, you know, Randy, tell me one of the revelations you learned in heaven. I felt like an audience of one. Like I was the most important person in the world to God. When Jesus looked at me, I felt that like there was nobody else in the world. I knew that the cares of the world were on his shoulder, but I felt that important. I felt like I was the only one. But I knew that that same love, that same devotion, and it was a clear devotion, is applicable to every one of his children. And I had been uh, in a loving family. I had experienced love. I had not gone through abuse, as some have. So I had experienced love as an action, an emotion, in a familial way. But I had never experienced love as a person. And once I, once I experienced that and saw how special I was to God, I caved again. I caved again. And he pulled me up. <laughs> and he hugged me so tight. And he never, during this time, let me go. And he didn't even have to say, I love you, because he was, he who was love. And I knew I was the most special person in the world. Amen. Would you look in the camera and tell those watching that they're the most special in the world? That what God, that's what God thinks? I know, without a doubt, as a former skeptic, as a former agnostic, I know, and I'm declaring it to you as the truth. God loves you as though you're the only person in the world. And if you were the only one for whom he would have to go to the cross, he would go, go there willfully in devotion to you. He loves you that much. He's the Lion of Judah protecting you and the Lamb of God always there to give in sacrificial and love that is consummate. You are loved. Amen. Tell me about his interceding for us. His interceding for us. Oh, my goodness. The, um, this is a part where the Lord was walking me through heaven and he had opened my eyes or my vision to this world. And I had saw a, a number of things happening. I could see with my spiritual eyes in heaven, and this is a dynamic in heaven, I could see Jesus interceding on behalf of other people. And I turned to uh, Jesus and I said, what, what are you looking for? Because he was looking over the people and it was a cityscape, so they were going back and forth. And he, he looked at me and he said, I'm looking for those who would listen, who are listening to me. And then I said, well, are you, and, and I almost half, uh, with a smile, I said, are they listening? 
<laughs> and he said, those who are wise. And then he had me look over and I saw the throne of God. I saw a floor with a, a blue fire from blue stones around the throne. And I saw the Father God in, in his glory. And I saw the angels all about. And I saw people all around the throne. And the Lord was declaring his creation and the newness to those below. And what I noticed were the busyness of people that the, Jesus had shown me. That they were, that it was those who were either unbelieving or they were just too busy to acknowledge uh, Jesus, to acknowledge the Lord. And it saddened the Lord. Sa it saddened Jesus. And it was the only time that I heard the morning cry of Jesus for the lost. It is so, Sid, if you were to be there in the presence of love and you were to hear this, the lamentation for those who are lost. It would be those who were lost, those who had either denied him or forgotten him. If they were to hear this morning cry, they would truly know that God grieves for them and intercedes for each of us in a way that is more profound and more impactful than anything we can possibly imagine in this life. But much to your disappointment, Jesus said to you, there's something I want you to do on earth. You must go back. So reluctantly, you went back, you came into your body, and you were hearing the most amazing songs, both sides in heaven and earth. <laughs> Explain that. Yes. I was resuscitated and I looked over at a couple who were at my bedside that had been praying for me. And they were singing in a glorious prayerful worship. Uh, and the Lord had told me in heaven that he was returning me for a purpose and that moment by moment he would reveal that purpose to me. And he said the prayer, the prayers of the saints have been heard in the hallways of heaven. And he was declaring me back to fulfill my purpose. But what, was, but I, what, I, what I first thought were just the couple singing beside me uh, I, I was too, too amazing for me uh, to fathom because it was exponentially uh, greater and more glorious than anything I have heard previously. And I realized that before I left heaven, that I'd heard that same song <laughs> being sung by the angels in heaven. The Lord showed me that the prayers of the saint, that couple and others who'd been praying for me, that, that song was the same song. Their will that I'd be returned here had been heard in heaven and joined with the will of God. It was sung, declared in, the he in heaven, and it was poured forth on earth. And that's why I'm here today. <laughs> Well, I know, I know that you feel there's something more, that you feel there is a special destiny for your life, but you've just gone year after year after year and nothing, nothing, nothing. It's time to come home. It's time for you to know that Jesus is inside of you to have your own experiential knowledge of God. I want you to repeat this prayer out loud. And there are many of you that need to say this prayer because you might have said a prayer, but you've never entered your own experiential knowledge of him. It's the difference between being red hot for Jesus or lukewarm. Big difference. Amen. Repeat this prayer out loud after me. Studio audience as well. Repeat after me. Dear God, Dear God I'm, a I'm a sinner for which I'm so sorry. So sorry. I, believe I believe your blood, your blood washed, away all of my sins. washed away all of my sins. 
and you have no memory of them. And I am clean. As the Bible says, I am as righteous as God. And now that I am clean, Jesus, come and live inside of me. I make you my Savior. I make you my Lord. I want my own experiential knowledge of you. Fill me with your glory. Amen. Randy, I want you now to pray for everyone that is watching us and in the studio audience. And I want you to pray that there be a transfer of the love of God that you return from heaven with. I want you to pray for miracles. I want you to pray that they have their own experience with God. Would you do that now? Yes, yes. Lord, right now, I ask for that Kairos moment that those who are watching, those who are listening, would not have to die physically to know you personally in a revelation of your presence and your glory. I pray that the power of God Almighty from his throne would come down and strike each of us with your presence and your love and the glory of God would break through our unbelief as we repent of our unbelief, as we repent of our self-righteousness, as we repent of those things which are impeding us from knowing you fully so that the generation of Joshua might go into the land, the promised land, so that this is the generation and that you might reveal yourself. You reveal, Lord God, the God of love, so that they cannot deny you, so that you become real in all things and there are no fears. We cast out, you have cast out fear. In the name of Jesus Christ, which we declare, there is no fear of any disease. There is no fear of any, anything, any force, power, principality, or spirit of darkness, because you are our Lord. You are our God. We declare you in righteousness and in freedom, and we commit our lives under your hand. Come down right now and reveal yourself to us mightily in Jesus' name. Alpha.